Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Socialist Telly. And uh, we've got a very international program for you tonight, all the way from Canada. We are bringing you John Smith, uh, the son of the renowned and much missed Harry Leslie Smith, uh, the world's oldest rebel, as he was termed. Uh, and we've got Dema joining us as well from Socialist Telly. Keep the discussion moving along. Uh, gents, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about your dad, John, what a character he was. So um, most people, I guess, who'll be watching the program tonight will be aware in, you know, some more, some less about who Harry Leslie Smith was. But uh, for the benefit of anyone watching who might not be, why don't you give us a little rundown on his background, uh, you know, is it how he started and then how he finished. And uh, then we can move on from there and, and go into some more detail. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Now, my dad was uh, born in Barnsley in 1923, uh, working mining family. Uh, they lived through great poverty. Uh, my dad's uh, elder sister uh, died of tuberculosis in a workhouse infirmary. Uh, my dad actually, at the age of three, even remembered just a dim memory of being on the pickets for the general strike with his dad. And that probably, along with his sister dying a horrible death in a working uh, workhouse infirmary because the family couldn't afford uh, the necessary types of convalescent that could have saved his sister, like Tony Benn's brother was saved from the same type of tuberculosis, because they could afford a convalescent home. Now, my dad went through a horrible childhood after his sister died. His father became unemployed because of the Great Depression. They moved from DOS house to DOS house. He ate from rubbish bins. It was just an incredibly miserable, horrific childhood that would have been tragic had it not been the fate of at least six million similar children, if not more, in Britain during that time because of the Great Depression. It, 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 it traumatized him throughout his entire life. But nonetheless, he did volunteer for the RAF, not necessarily because he had a great deal of patriotism for the country, but because he really wanted to get out of his town and he wanted to fight for something, which was the beverage report, which was this idea that the beverage report was going to give working class people a much better stand in life with a labor government after the war. After the war, of course, he votes labor, marries my mother, who was German. They meet in Hamburg during the Allied occupation. They emigrate back to the UK. Uh, my parents live in Yorkshire for quite a long time, and then they emigrate to Canada for a bit. In between then, uh, my, my parents have a family. I have an, had an older brother named Peter. He had schizophrenia or, or was he, he, he had mental illness, which was schizophrenia. And uh, he died after my mother. Uh, he died of not schizophrenia, but a lung ailment. And he died at 50. It was tragic. It was horrible. At that time, when he died, uh, my dad was broken. So it was in a way to repurpose my dad. But I suggested he start working on his life history. And... For about three years, him and I worked on our own with very little encouragement from anybody trying to get his story out. Finally, an agent in London clued in that this was good stuff. They got him a book deal. He wrote a great book called Harry's Last Stand. Then when the book came out, it was the 2014, general, uh, 2014 Labor conference time. So he was invited there, but he was really only invited for the fringe event. He did a fringe event. And then somebody said, do you want to speak on healthcare?" And he said, blimey, do I ever? Mm. So he wrote probably the best speech from a working class non-politician uh, about public health care. And he delivered it live at what, quite frankly, up until that point, was an incredibly tedious, uh, banal conference. And it exploded because suddenly the people in the audience started to realize this is what labor is about. By the next day, the independence front page said, finally, labor finds its voice. From that period on, 
from 2014 until 2018, my dad basically barnstormed through Britain and the world to fight for public health care, to fight for the right of a social welfare state, to fight for socialism, to advocate for refugee rights. And he used all of the time left that he had on this earth to, as he said, not make his past our future. 2018, uh, after, a, uh, after a year of sort of on and off bad health, he just died of a very bad case of pneumonia in an ICU. And then from that point on, it's been my job to try to maintain his legacy. Although unfortunately, in between then, I got cancer, which wasn't the best of things. But that's, that's basically what my father did. And in that time period, he wrote five books, hosted a podcast, did interviews everywhere, and, and it was all about one thing, getting the word out that the working class is a movement of great brilliance, honor, integrity, depth, and compassion. And it should be listened to much more so than the few toffs that seem to control our societies and governments around the world. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I've been, well, I mean, too much, because there's so much to talk about with him. I'm in two minds about where to start, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of flip my original order on its head, really, and ask, first of all, um, because, I mean, he was well known as a, as a big supporter of Jeremy Corbyn, and we'll go into that in more detail. Uh, but Jeremy is no longer leading the Labour Party. Um, what passes for leadership of the Labour Party at the moment is Keir Starmer. What would your dad have, have made of him as a, as a leader, first off? Oh, he would have been—he would have been disgusted at his leadership. First of all, he would have been disgusted that he's, he, 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 as my dad would have said, he's a lying bastard because he got in on promises to protect the left, to honor the pledges of Corbyn's uh, leadership on on a whole host of things, and once he became leader, he began backtracking on anything. My father was one thing about my father was you stick by your word. You're an honest, upfront person, and this this is this is just something where he would not tolerate that type of duplicity from a labor leader. With 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 Starmer's leadership, again, my father would have been just outraged because it would have reminded him of basically a photocopy of Tony Blair, not the same Tony Blair, but more a watered down Tony Blair that even has less power less personality than Tony Blair, but is a, an empty suit that is there to do the bidding of people that don't have the best interests of the ordinary person in Britain. Mm -hmm. And that would be his issue. And also his issue would be, I think, is, is that, he, that my father had a great belief in the 1945 Labour government and what that stood for and what other Labour governments tried to stand for up until Blair took over. And that that was something that had to be held sacrosanct. It could, it could evolve in all of those things. But the tenets of socialism, the mm. tenets of never having a housing crisis because you're building enough council estates and enough housing for ordinary people, that you will always have proper wages for workers and you will have employment that is fair and equal. And for those that can't work, a benefit system that doesn't humiliate them and drag them into the gutter. All of those things you, you would not see with Starmer. And I know I'm not putting words in, in his mouth. And I think the thing is that Starmer, and this is one thing that I, I was amazed about. I don't think Starmer had any respect for my dad either. Because when this Captain Tom thing went on, and I saw that when, when Captain Tom died, Starmer put out some obsequious tweet about what a great patriot and man he was, even though he was a staunch Tory. And I thought, I'm going to research to see what he said on the day of my dad's death. And you know what he said? Nothing. Hmm. It's absolutely nothing he said, which shows to me that Starmer idea of the Labour Party was already preset by 2018, that he had nothing, nor did he want anything to do with the socialism that my dad supported through Jeremy Corbyn. Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I'd venture to suggest we could we could play old uh, tapes and quotes of your dad's, mm -hmm. and that would be far better leadership for the Labour Party than uh, even now than anything be. that uh, that's in there at the moment. Um, 
the other thing that Keir Starmer is very keen on at the moment is military action. And your dad served in World War II, um, spent, what, four or five years, maybe more than that, in the RAF. Yep. Uh, also spent time in occupied Germany after the war and so on. Um, what would he make of the, the current eagerness to bang a war drum and, you know, to paint that as patriotic? I, I think my dad was very proud that he served in the RAF during the Second World War, and he was proud of his uh, time uh, in the Allied occupation forces as well. But what my dad learned most about soldiering and what happens to soldiers was during the Great Depression, because the DOS house, houses that my dad lived in with his family were filled with vets from the Great War that had been forgotten by society from that so-called, you know, a, 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 a home fit for heroes sort of thing. And, and all of those men had been crushed, gassed, they lost legs. And my father as a boy is growing up amongst these men who went because their peers, their government leaders, their politicians told them it was the patriotic thing to do. And I think what he would look at somebody like Starmer is going, you know what? You're not going to die. None of your kids are going to die. None of anybody that you know is going to be harmed or affected by any war you declare. So you better have some humility and think before you commit any British troop to a conflict. Because the thing is, Britain isn't an empire anymore. It doesn't, it cannot do anything. This is, this is, it's not that it can't do anything, but it has to work under diplomatic ways. And it cannot pretend that it has this military might or, or, or it, it, because it's, it, it's just basically like 60 year old men trying to pretend that they have the strength and, 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 and heft of, a, of their 25 year old self. And it's ridiculous. But the thing is, Starmer's doing it because he's trying to ape the Tories and say, look, it, we're more patriotic than you. We <coughs> will commit soldiers to the field willy nilly. So you can see that we love our country more, which is just ridiculous, because I'll tell you this, the ones who love their country most are the ones that will not fight in unjust wars and go to prison for it, protest against it and fight against it. And those are the same people like those that are fighting against the war in Russia and those people here that say, wait a second, this is not the way we can win against Putin. We have to think outside of the box this time. Starmer has no no solutions. And the other thing is, and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but the thing is that what always amazed me, and it's not just Starmer, it's everybody, but the thing is that Starmer goes, you know, this is like this, this is like the Second World War, this is like a fight against Hitler and all of this stuff. And I'm going, well, maybe yes, maybe no. But the thing is, is that during World War II, they had already, con they had already conceived by 1943 that they couldn't have another war like this so that they... They created things like the United Nations and all of these other institutions that would be there at the end of the war. We have none of this. And don't tell me it's because we're only 60 days into the war or anything like that. Mm. It's because they don't want to think that way. They want the normality of before the war to exist where they can still exploit and they can still cause mayhem, but without any of those protective gears that will stop us from invading other countries like Iraq. Yeah, patriotism too often with our politicians today seems to be how many flags they can stand in front yep. of. But for the, the narratives and the mantras that they keep coming up with, the only flags we tend to end up seeing too, all too often are the ones draping coffins. And I think we're all tired of seeing scenes like that, especially over the last several decades in wars. Frankly, we had no business in, in, in being involved in all too often. Um, did you, I mean, you, your father obviously served served in world war ii fantastic um thing to be able to uh to to, to say you done frankly you're saving the world arguably but what did his what were his opinions on on, on more modern conflicts and and the reasons behind them going into them well he, he, the simple fact is that he and and he didn't believe that there was any just war after the Second World War. And he also believed that it had to be the, the Second World War had to be divided up because the European conflict is a just war. But is the the war in Asia a just war because it's a war of colony uh, of colonial powers fighting another power that wants to be a colonial power or a greater colonial power? 
So where is the justice there? Because it's not a war of democracy, it's a war of empires. In Europe, it, it is, there is there is a case to be made that is very just, fighting against Hitler's uh, uh, genocidal war. After, anything after, my, my, my father was dead set against the Iraq war. He was dead set against any involvement in Afghanistan. And and it's because and 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 sadly I have to admit this. When 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 the when the Iraq war started, I was sort of for Blair. My dad wasn't gonna listen to any of that stuff. And he was right. He gave me bollockings on a daily basis when we would fight against this, right? And and, and I mean and we'd get quite heated. But in the end, I it, it took me several weeks into the war to realize I was very wrong and my dad was very right about the nature of modern warfare and the reasons why people are fighting in Iraq. And at that point, my dad never never trusted wars because he goes, you can always look, look at a war and you're going, why is it that all of the politicians are always best friends with the arms makers? Because everybody is making a, making a pound off of this. Everybody is always profiting from this except the ordinary people, the soldier, and the civilians in a conflict zone. So he would have been against it. And he would have been against any idea of a boots on the ground against Russia, because that's it's just our annihilation. That's the end. I don't know. I, I think the thing is, is that there would be a point where he might have agreed with some of the arms shipments. Now, at this point, I think what we're getting into is we're, we're turning this proxy war into uh, a full scale conflict between us and Russia, because the more types of armaments that we send in, the more that this becomes a provocation, which will end with us fighting them. And he would have been dead set against that. Well, it's, we're seeing a little bit of that in the uh, in the media, especially the, the Russian Putin supporting uh, mouthpieces saying, oh, we're going to set up a drone off the coast of the UK and cover you in a radioactive tsunami. And they're only a little island. They can't, uh, they can't tolerate with this. And of course, <laughs> Not long ago, we were suggesting no fly zones. Um, uh, yeah. until <laughs> rapidly shut down until they realized what that was. And of course, I mean, when it comes to to President Zelensky, um, also often he's asking for for weaponry and he's asking for military aid. But I must have missed the days when he was asking for medicines and humanitarian aid. And it just the narratives are getting very, very confused and very, very muddled. I think. Well, um, it, 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 it's the thing is, is that it, it is, it, and, and I mentioned this in a tweet, I think yesterday, where I, I was going, you know, I think they're asking and they're getting about 7 billion US dollars per month in total aid. And I'm going, this is going to end up like Iraq, where 7 billion is going in, but you only can account for 1 billion per month, where you know where it was spent. And the other 6 billion somehow ends in some spibs back pocket. And uh, that that you're just creating an incredible corrupt society, and this is what's never discussed because I am, I I I believe in the self determination of countries. I certainly believe that with Ukraine, but nobody's ever discussed that Ukraine was the second poorest country in Europe. Now this is before the invasion, so it's there's got to be an element of corruption to be the second poorest nation, if you know, and the, and then what it does is is that the media starts presenting its capital as if that's the rest of the country. And that's not the case. The rest of the country, in my opinion, and what I've heard, uh, is that there is there's just great dysfunction even before the war. And, and, and that we're not talking about that. We're talking about Ukraine as if it's France. Or more to the point, we're really talking about it like it's Belgium 1914. And that's... That's where we're, we're getting into to strong difficulties. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't want to fixate on um, military interventions any further. Um, there was an awful lot of people who were very, very fond of, of your father, have very fond memories of him and have different um, and relate to him in different ways, I suppose. An awful lot of us stood with Harry, especially after that speech he gave at that Labour conference on health. He was loved by socialists and campaigners of country over. I don't think... That's an exaggeration to say that for the no. people that, that knew of him and saw him. And 
for a lot of us, the one thing that will always stand out was that appreciation of the NHS he had, because of course he he came from a time before it existed. His words still echo now. It's it's certainly the first words of his that always come to my mind. Don't let my past become your future. And he also said that he was convinced the NHS would not exist in 20 years, not because it's too costly, but because the entitled are too greedy. And it That's still right. appears to be the case that Harry is sadly on course to be proven right. Um, did Harry have any ideas as to how this issue could be addressed or was he really resigned to it going? No, you know, he, he was not resigned to it going. But what he wanted was people to have the gumption of his generation uh, at the end of the war and even during the war and even slightly before it, where they said, you know what, we don't need to take this. We will use our, our, our membership and trade unions. We will use our labor party. We will use our newspapers, because the working class had newspapers, they had trade unions, they had all of these things. And this is what my father wanted to return to, so that there were effective mechanisms to prevent the 1% from totally controlling all the wealth and all of the prosperity of, a, of, of Britain. And, and, and so he believed that the only way that this was going to happen was through direct action, not just voting every couple of years, not just sitting back, but general strikes, protests, mm -hmm. doing what Gandhi did, doing what Mandela did, doing all these things. And when I talk about Mandela, I'm not talking about terrorism or anything like that. I'm talking about civil disobedience that hits at the heart of an economy, that tells the, tells the entitled that they do not have a right to steal the labor of others. They do not have a right to steal the NHS from the people of England, Scotland, or Wales and Northern Ireland that this is a dividend that the greatest generation left to all future generations. And it should be defended much more so than any bloody flag or royal family member. This is our heritage, is the NHS. Because according to my dad, he said that he thought it was the most brilliant thing ever. It was the tide that raised all boats. Of course, he and that's a, that's that, that's patriotism, you know, yep. the, to to stand up for you, the your nation's greatest achievement and not let it be taken bit by bit from under us. And sadly, that process is very far on and has gone farther in the last week or so because of the, uh, you know, the passage of this bill that is going to incentivize right. NHS bodies to cut treatment, similar to what they have in the US, where they'll they'll get in they'll get rewarded for not treating people and saving money that way, which will, will of course cost lives and pushes further and further down the road of having to, uh, you know, having these co-payments as they call them in, in the US where you've yeah. got to pay for your treatment yourself. Um, and I think that's the, uh, you know, the, the shocking thing at the moment is how dulled people are. And it's been very deliberate, I think, to, you know, from, from the diet of reality TV through to the constant lying of the so-called mainstream media, et cetera, to people, to just dull people into a sense of, not even security, but just apathy of thinking, well, it's it's just the way it is. And, it, you know, this word unsustainable makes me laugh because in 1945, the UK was in mired in debt far beyond anything that's happened ever oh, since. Yeah. And, you know, and, and they the, the just come out of a war. The nation was essentially on its knees. And yet we managed to build the entire welfare state out of that and the political will to be there. And there isn't anything at the moment. Uh, of political will to really change that because the Labour Party, such as it is, you know, mas masquerading under that badge in the same way that a lot of organisations masquerade as the NHS these days, um, has no real intention or interest in uh, in actually challenging and changing that situation. They don't want to change that narrative. They're quite happy to usher it along and, uh, you know, put us, let the NHS continue to drain out like uh, sand out of an hourglass. And, yeah. uh, to, you know, I can't forgive them for that. And, and, um, and the other thing is, too, is and, 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 and I, I'm always amazed because the, the thing is, and I was talking about this with, with a friend because we were talking about, and, and it, this is just a, a, not a segue back to Putin, but this idea that the, the news media says he's out of touch, he has yes men all around him. And I'm going, what do you bloody think any MP has around them? <laughs> just yes people that continuously reinforce their prejudices and their sense of entitlement and the reason that they're doing good work by listening to a lobbyist rather than being in a, uh, a surgery meeting with uh, a constituent that really needs help. They're out 
even when they do their constituency meetings, they're not really there all of the time in the sense of doing right for their constituents. They and and this is this is the problem with with our political system, that the people there are too well off to actually have any connection to ordinary Britain anymore. They're subsidized left, right, and center, and that they know that if they do their time and vote like the whip says, they will get a good job after politics. They will be rewarded for being a good lapdog. And that's that's yeah, that revolving door. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, it, it, it is that it is that and it is it's it's self-serving <clears throat> and politics is supposed to be, you know, this this wonderful um, profession that people get elected to to serve the country and and do wonderful things. And it never happens. It just becomes soured. And this whole business of, you know, the way we elect politicians for a start doesn't help with the fact that you get so many seats in this country you never change hands from one party to another. So anybody who gets that seat is guaranteed. A job for life and as you say john they're guaranteed a a, a seat on the uh, on, on a, a board with a, a healthy yeah. wage bag and a pension straight afterwards uh it's infuriating that we cannot seem to get ordinary working class people elected to parliament anymore even amongst the labor party no and and and, and the thing is too is that, like i said with the labor party it the corbin the corbin period was this brilliant ray of sunshine that broke through politics, and 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 for there, my father actually felt optimism that political change would actually happen, not incrementally, but with the speed and haste of 1945 under a Corbyn premiership. And then, like he was alive for the 2017 election, and he he stumped for it, and he was disgusted. By the by the PLP and mm. the backstabbing that went on mm. because he goes the thing is with my dad was he was he was not connected to anybody he was just an ordinary fellow so he understood because he was an ordinary person the suffering that everybody was going through and yet you know he could you know have you know drinks with MPs and all of this stuff but he thought most of them were all a bunch of bullshit artists right that they that that was wrong right that that he would much he much preferred right having a beer down at the pub watching the footy with an ordinary person where it wasn't this person that was pretending to be his friend or mm -hmm. pretending to understand what suffering what poverty is like what it is like not to have health care because it, most of it is just cosplay for them Right. And, and, and this is this is what what he thought was. And this is why the Corbin, the Corbin years. Were absolutely my dad thought this was the moment. And he and that's why he said to me, he said, I will use as much breath and time as I have to fight for Corbin because he is the only one and with his team that can make real transformation and give people real hope that they will have a prosperous present and future. That is built upon socialism, built upon a, 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 a system that allows for profit, but also allows for taxation. And it allows that everybody has the equal chance to live a good life. But the current rewriting of history that's been going on is, is desperately uh, being done to pretend that Jeremy Corbyn was the reason that uh, we lost the election in 2019. And everybody knows really that it was the push to have another referendum that cost us ma massive amounts of uh, seats in, you know, in areas that had voted leave and was, was insane to do it. No, um, I... You know, but they're, they're, to do that, they're having to pretend that he's somehow toxic and unpopular. And yet, you know, I mean, I, I live in Liverpool and uh, we had a May Day celebration on Sunday to celebrate International Workers' Day. Jeremy Corbyn came up to speak for that and uh, I saw him before the event and, you know, just random people in the street, um, waiters and waitresses in the cafe where he stopped off for a cup of coffee. He was getting mobbed, for, you know, by, by people he, you know, probably, probably yeah. never, never had much of an active part in politics before him. Um, wanted to take selfies with him, wanted to shake his hand, wanted to give him a hug. 
people know what the reality is and they're not buying the bullshit as the, as, as to, to use your word that that is being sold to them at the moment by by the media um but I, there's a quote of your dad's that i wanted to kind of bring up because it, it echoes with me really in that you know he campaigned like crazy for for jeremy and against the tories but he said that uh he said of jeremy he said he'll learn he has to put some more weight behind it uh, i'm behind him and we'll work with him so your dad was a you know was a was a bit of a bare knuckle fighter when it came to actually trying to campaign for yeah. change. So you know what did he what did he mean by that and and well, what, well my what my dad knew like I said my dad my dad was born in Barnsley he grew up in Barnsley he knew that if you wanted something you had to fight for it to the bitter end and not you had to use every tactic possible and that also included brutal force an elimination of those that were not going to be part of your regeneration of Britain. And, and, and the thing is, is that that's, that's what my dad thought was Jeremy's fatal flaw was he was too much of a nice guy. Hmm. And if he had to be too much of a nice guy, he wasn't delegating the role of strong person to somebody else to cut the ties from anyone that was going to prevent a labor victory. And that, that was, that was what my dad saw was, was Jeremy's major, pro, major problem or, 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 or Achilles heel was that he tried to see the good in too many people that were out to, uh, to get him. And I, I remember we were at, um, uh, PMQs once, my dad and I, at, in the visitors' uh, gallery. And afterwards, we met with Jeremy in his office. And my dad was behind. He was talking to somebody and that sort of thing. And this was when Jeremy set up the, uh, where, where, where his PMQ questions were based upon what, what the public had asked him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he went to me, he goes, what did Harry think about that? What did Harry think about that? And I said, and I said well, I said, you can talk to Harry. But I said, I think Harry's going to say that he thinks that you should go for the jugular, right? That uh, that's what you should be doing at PMQs every time is going for the jugular because it's a, it's a sound bite. That's all it is. It, it is absolutely the most pointless theater for anything other than <coughs> getting sound bites, PMQs now. It, it, it doesn't hold anybody to account. It's just sort of pr to pretend within the, 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 the frame of a television screen that, aha, we got them. Mm. But, but that, was, that was his feeling. And, and like I said, but overall, uh, he had so much faith in, in Jeremy, and it was all well founded. Jeremy uh, was there when my dad was dying. Their office was always in contact with me to make sure that everything was okay. And uh, they gave him a wonderful send off at the memorial in London. Uh, and, 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 and in many ways, they were political mates. But what my dad saw in Jeremy was, he goes, because that's what my dad also respected, being a good father. And he said, Jeremy, he's a he he he, he he's he's a top uh, top bloke. He, he's so good with his children. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, is perhaps a little bit underrated with with Jeremy actually, uh, and his three sons. We see obviously we see Tommy quite frequently on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, we see the old pictures of them together quite often actually. So yeah. perhaps that's uh, not surprising. Um, but you know. Well, since I've brought Twitter up, many of us um, socialists, many of us on the left came to know about Harry through his use of social media. He became this this great celebrity on Twitter. Um, and I suppose I wrongfully always imagine older people sort of shunning or struggling with technology. I guess I judge them by my own family. My mother only recently learned how to send a text message. Um, but, but Harry seemed to be well away with it. I guess some yep. people might wonder if it was really him. No, was, no, no, it was him. Now, now the thing is that what I, I, and, and he, we always brought this up because the thing is in the 1980s, I remember he was the one that introduced computers into his, into the company he worked for, for inventory purposes and that sort of thing. Oh. And, and it was one of those things because he wasn't, you know, he, he, he liked computers. And when the internet uh, arrived and that sort of thing, he was very excited by it. My mom was excited by it and they were the first people to buy PCs. And, and this sort of thing, so that my dad understood and liked 
certain technologies, other things. He couldn't work the bloody uh, remote if his life depended on it. But with computers, he seemed to be quite good. And that with the Twitter thing, it worked well for him because the way that he constructed and spoke in sentences, they were very tightly packed. Hmm. And like he said, I learned his first use of a medium was in the RAF when he became a wireless operator. So he always knew how to make short, mm. informative mm. Uh, the, messages. The, 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 ah, yeah. So that, that's why, and, and it was one of those things. Now, what we, what we did in the morning, because again, this is the, the, the thing about Harry, my dad, and all of that stuff, is that all what he did wasn't, um, it wasn't as a hobby. It was as a political construct to affect change. So that we would have discussions in the morning about what he wanted to tweet about, what he thought I would be going through the newspapers, he would be going through the newspapers, and there would be a, a rationale developed of what the theme would be for any given day or week. So that, that's how we worked in a collaborative effort in that way. But up until he took ill and I announced that I was on Twitter, it was him. And it was the same thing because he took ill, and this was before he became famous, Mm -hmm. And he took ill and he just said, you know, at that time, he said, just tell him I'll be away for a week or so because I'm in the hospital. And I did. And that was it. And I think that was 2012. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. It's always, I, I always think it's great. You know, you've seen, I mean, it, it wasn't meant to be a, an ageist point or anything. No, like no. That. It's certainly mm -hmm. just, it's, it's, it's certainly my experience. My family are largely hopeless with technology. Um, but uh yeah it, it is one of those mediums where it, it does lend itself to making these short sharp political points and it's certainly where news seems to spread the fastest across any yeah. form of social media so it's it's i think it's absolutely lovely that he uh he was so uh familiar with it and he was clearly uh clearly had a flair for it when he ended up i think about two hundred thousand followers in the end well at, at his death it was like two hundred and fifty thousand followers now oh. there was now there was during that week of his death i think he gained there was a lot of rubbernecking going on too right so there was like he gained like fifty thousand followers during that week of his death and some of that was legitimate concern and interest and others were there was an incredible amount of trolling going on at that time too. Yeah. And and it, it's like, and most of them, I must say, were centrists. And uh, that they they were trolling while he was dying and that sort of thing and after he died. And and it it was it it, it was unbelievable. There were pictures, there was one fellow, and I can't remember his name, so I won't mention it, uh, but uh, he was he was saying because it was around Christmas time or near my dad died at the end of November. So there, he was saying that I was going to put uh, Christmas lights around his corpse. There's nothing moderate about the so-called moderates. That's the funny part of it. I mean, this yeah. is the, you know, I was never a subscriber to this idea of the nicer kind of politics. Sorry, Jeremy. Um, because I subscribe to this view that you've got, you know, if you get the, the opportunity, you've got to be ruthless for the sake of the, of the movement of everybody, yeah. you know, um it was interesting to watch the so-called moderates uh whine and moan the whole time about bullying that really wasn't happening and you know i would have liked to see more ruthlessness exercised with them but they they painted it and the media helped them to paint it as though they were being picked on and as soon as they've got their chance to uh you know to exercise what they want to do they're doing exactly what they were complaining about that wasn't even really happening to them i'm going to do a quick couple of housekeeping things and then we need to talk about your uh, your book john uh, first off, obviously we're we're competing against the uh, the big match tonight. Liverpool yes. playing in the semi final of the uh, European Championship, so uh, this will remain available on catch up. And do please uh, share the link of this as far as you can and let people see what's going on. Uh, and the other thing is, there have been a couple of questions which I haven't popped up on screen because some people want to know what they're about, but people asking about uh, a particular program that's due this week on Socialist Telly, which is the showing of a film. Uh, the anatomy of a witch hunt, which is uh, about the behaviour of the Labour right towards the left in the party uh, ever since Keir Starmer took over. Um, and people are asking when that's going to be on. Don't know for sure yet, because we're waiting to receive the subtitled version of the film 
uh, to be able to put it out. But I'm told that we will have it by the end of this week. And as soon as we've got it, we will uh, do everything to get it out same day on air so that people can uh, can watch that because it is a cracking film. I saw it last week and uh, they will want to see what's been uh, what's been going on and what gets revealed in that. So that's just answering that couple of questions. Now, John, you've written a book. Yes. And uh, you are looking for some help in getting that published. And we're hoping that we can drum that up for you tonight as well um, that would, in, terms that would of, be... uh, in terms of getting that out there so people can see more of your dad's legacy. So tell us a bit about what you've written. Okay. And, and now, what you need. The, 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 my book, it's 56,000 words. It's called I Stood With Harry. And it's, it's, it, it's a look at the years, the 10 years, last 10 years of my dad's life and how I repurposed him after my brother died. Because when my brother died at the age of 50, my dad was 87. And my mother had died 10 years previous to that. And he just felt gutted. He was 87. He thought, that's it. I'm done. And, and he was outraged that his son should die before him. Not at the son, but that, it, that he had such a cruel fate that he had to witness uh, my brother die. Because also my brother didn't have such a great life because he, he had schizophrenia. And, and he was a brilliant, beautiful artist and a great human being and all of that stuff. And my father caregived him, care, caregived him with my mother uh, for, uh, from when, when he was from the age of 20 until he was 48. Uh, and, and so that they had invested all of their, their, their retirement years in keeping him safe and healthy, and then he died. And because of all of that stuff, my, my father was a mess. I was a mess, too, because I'd lost my, my brother. We ended up in Portugal, where my dad got very sick, and uh, he had a blood clot. I took him back to Canada, which is where we lived at the time, and I went to him. I said, we've got two choices, I think, anyways. I said... I can, I was in the wine and spirits trade then. I said, I can go back to work, my wine and spirits trade, go back on the road. And we can make a lot of money because I'm rather good at this. Or we can do something else, which is kind of unique. And we can make your life into books with, with my help going through all of your stuff, helping you. And it's not that he was a bad writer or anything like that, but it's he had a tremendous amount of PTSD and trauma from all of those years. And it was, he wrote everything, but it was to almost psychoanalyze him, to go through the drafts after drafts, to get him to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So three books were written, uh, which were 1923, Love Among the Ruins and Empress of Australia. At that point, he was picked up by a, uh, a, a publisher. And my book is about those 10 years and, and what happened and how he reacted to it. But it's also about what happened after he died. When a year after he died, I was diagnosed right after the 2019 general election, which I knew I wasn't well then. I was diagnosed with uh, bowel cancer. And I had to go through treatment and operations during COVID. And I used... This, this book is a letter to Harry over a series of chapters about me piecing back together my life by remembering what we did, the traumas that he went through, and also telling about our family dynamics, but also how do you make a socialist? How do you become a socialist? And how does that affect modern British politics? And how did that affect what my dad did? And, and then the question is in this book, did we do any good? Did, 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 did he affect change? Was it worth it to give up those eight years to, to charge at windmills sometimes? And, and it was. That's the ultimate answer. It was. And that's in the book. That political action is redemptive action. And that this is about a book about a father's, son, a father's love for his son, but also a son's love for his father. That is then this Harry's Last Stand. A creation that is just unbelievable because we both came from nothing. We're both political in the sense that we voted labor and had socialist intentions, but we were not politicians and we didn't hang out with politicians. And we created a helpful element to modern British politics and to Canadian politics as well. So that's what my book is in a nutshell. It's, it's an examination of a working class life 
by a son knocked down by cancer and trying to make sense of his life and how all of this relates to Corbynism, Blairism, neoliberalism, and everything in between. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. And there are funny parts in it too. And there are also parts about, which is uh, there are parts about uh, Dennis Skinner getting into a fight with Keith Baz, which is very funny. Uh, there is all, all of the revelations of all of the MPs with their names in the book who phoned my dad wanting to coup against Corbyn. And uh, that these will be interesting people to find. That they uh, that they were that they were backstabbing Corbin and uh, trying to get my dad to join them. Wow! Uh, well, that sounds like a must-read. So we need somebody to uh, to publish that. Um, there yeah, are, it is it is difficult to get a book out against the kind of establishment consensus at the moment, but it is possible to do it. Uh, we've seen one that's just come out. I forget the title, but you know, dissecting Keir Starmer's actions as leader of the Labour Party, etc., and who he is. That's the one. Uh, so if Oliver Eagle can get it done, then I'm sure that we can get it done for Harry. So uh, if anybody's watching out there or knows anybody uh, who can help, then make sure you stick this under their nose and uh, let's let's get that done. Um, I want to read it, certainly. So we need to get it into uh, into print and onto ebooks and all the rest of it. Um, it's quick. Again, another little housekeeping things. Maria asking about the program we talked about just now um about the anatomy of the witch hunt um can you put it online as i don't own a tv it will be online it'll go out on the uh socialist telly social media channels twitter youtube and uh squawk box facebook just like this uh this broadcast is going out now so don't worry you'll be able to see it um and again from maria here she's obviously looking forward to the book uh <laughs> she would like to uh to get hold of it and uh yeah, whoever is uh, is out there with some publishing connections, let's uh, let's make sure we get that done. My my, uh, best to, got... my, my, my best to Maria Nelson. She is uh, a wonderful person that's always tweeting me. She belongs to my Substack. She's just a great great person. So I just saw her on the crawl down there, and I wanted to say hello. All right, okay. Well, tell us about your Substack as well, because I'm 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 not very familiar with what that is, but it's some kind of a subscription service for yeah, it's a subscription digital. service, and it's it it's either you you have an option of it being free or a paid subscription, and it has it's serializing as well as my essays. It has my my dad Harry Leslie Smith's unpublished essays, and also I am serializing his first book, 1923, on it, and his third book, Empress of Australia. And it also has uh, podcasts uh, from my dad that were unpublished when he was alive. Oh, wow, it sounds on. fantastic! Is that will people find that on the Harry's Last Stand dot ca that's going across the bottom? Yeah, it's it's just mind. basically again, all you have to do in Substack is type in Harry's Last Stand because that's the title. Everything is Harry's Last Stand. Super, um, great stuff. I have a feeling that we've kind of done what we needed to do. Uh, unless there's any particular pressing points that uh, you, John, or you, Demo, want to want to add into the program in the last. I just wanted to ask mm -hmm. how your health is now, John. Actually, because um, um, cancer is a beastly thing. Yeah, it uh, it it really uh, it, it 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 was a it was a hell of a ride. Now, as it stands now, I have another CAT scan coming up in a couple of months. They they have removed the cancer. They now and then they find suspicious things, but I think it's going to be an up and down thing. For the next couple of years, and then knock wood, I get to walk away from this. And well, get, if you're you know, as tough as your father was, then yeah, uh, we will. Oh yeah, no, and it, it, it it's like the the, the worst. Thing, it, it, I cracked up because, and this is in the book too. When I was operated on, I was operated on in Toronto, and the woman in the bed opposite me happens to be from Leicester, and she happens to be a bloody Tory. And I'm going, I'm in Toronto, I'm trying to get away from Tories, and she's there talking about Boris Johnson to her mother on, on, on her Facebook uh, chat. And it's just going, you cannot escape them. Oh, you're supposed to be in recovery. That's I know, I that's what I said, right? I said. Well, you can't even get away from them in the Labour Party now, I think that's the problem. So uh, 
There's a question from Lynn McKinney. Uh, can we help crowdfund John's book? Is that an option? That well, that, could, that's uh, an option. I think we will wait and see because what I want to I want to see is is that, like I said, all we need is a small publisher. I won't take an advance or anything like that. I just want to see this book out because this is about all of all of this is always about preserving my dad's legacy, keeping this alive, because. Like I said, I've already gone through cancer. I don't know how long I've got. I hope I've got a long time. But I want to make sure that what he did and what his generation did and the memories that my dad had are are held for a little while longer. Also in the People's Museum, his leather jacket is, and there's a, uh, a, a display going up very soon from what I know. And I will be donating more memorabilia to the People's Museum because I think it's a fantastic organization and I think that that's where a lot of his uh, his his physical things should be. Wonderful. Fantastic. This is um, like a sixth Harry Leslie Smith book that's unpublished. This is this is gold. This is come yeah. on, there must be a, a publisher yeah. out there who's going to take this on because it, it's you, you can't. You, it, it's Harry for heaven's sake. This is yeah, uh, I know, and and it's like I said, they they will make it. They will make their money back, right? Because there will be enough people that will buy this book to know a little bit more about Harry Leslie Smith and just sort of remember him again. Absolutely. Though I have yeah, a feeling well, there'll be people timely, in the field. You know, it's just, it's, it, what, the messages he had are more needed than ever, really, and uh, sadly he's not around to, to be able to no, deliver them in person. So that's the... And and the other thing that I want to do, and I've been trying to do, and they, I think it'll eventually happen is, uh, his centenary would be next year because he was born in 23. But I've been trying to get Halifax Council to put a blue plaque up on the house that he lived with his mother from 36 to 41 before he left. And then when he came back after the war, he lived there, too. It's on, it's on Boothtown Road. But I think that a plaque there to remember that Harry Leslie Smith was a resident of Boothtown Road and worked in the carpet mills nearby as a young man should be remembered. As, yes. As a blue plaque. Mm. Ellie's asking, uh, where is the People's Museum? It's in Manchester. All right, okay. So get yourself to Manchester and you'll be able to see uh, Harry's uh, Harry's memorabilia. They've got a great banner exhibition on there right now, too. All right, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, I think I know where it is. I've seen it. Fellas, I think we'll call it a night there. Sounds um, good. John, I really appreciate your time, Devo, you too. Um, Thank you. Good luck with the book. I will will certainly be uh, in there with the pre-order as soon as we know it's going to be getting uh, getting produced. And uh, yeah, I'll just say, you know, if you want to, um, if you've got contacts with that and you think you can activate something, then you can either get to the harryslaststand.ca website or you can drop an email through to tips, T-I-P-S at squawkbox.com. And uh, pass on the contact details, and I'll make sure that they get to John so that uh, so that we can get something moving. Um, appreciate everybody who's watched us. If you're watching this on catch up, thank you for that too. And as I mentioned before, do share it, and uh, let's make sure that we get the word out and uh, people can hear uh, what's going on. Great man, and greatly missed. Good night, everybody. Thank you ever so much. Good night. <laughs>